All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios. We're within a couple weeks now, the French Open starting. A special guest on this week's show, Last to talk to him. Uh, he is self-proclaimed the only guy who watches tennis and enjoys it in America from Barstool Sports, Eric Hubs, Barstool's Hubs himself. Thanks for joining the show, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, usually when I come on a podcast, I'm talking Yankees, baseball, all that. It's it's kind of refreshing to be asked to come on a tennis podcast. Very excited. Um, I think there's probably a few more people that like tennis in America besides me, but at Barstool, for sure, I think it's basically just me. I was going to bring that up. We can we can get to it. I think the first time, I mean, I'd, I've seen your work on Twitter and you keep the game alive, which I appreciate, but it yeah. was that rundown clip from Wimbledon 2019. We were all hurting for the people that were, you know, looking at Fed in that match and thinking yeah. this was the last chance, but that was kind of when you went mainstream. And I mean, if there was ever a match to do that, it had everything and it really did capture the non-tennis fans too. Oh my God. That was, it's painful. Like to look back on every part, I, I'll go back and, just like hate watch it not, not that clip but also like the match itself but um yeah i i kind of forgot about it until it resurfaced uh like a week ago or whatever and uh yeah it's painful but yeah i i, I love tennis i've loved federer forever i thought he was just the coolest dude when he played just breed just everything you think of when you think of tennis excellence yeah. so um yeah it's been my guy forever so was that the guy that first got you into the game? Uh, there's not you know because there's not enough there's not a lot of info about you you're kind of mysterious on the internet so is that the first thing that got you into tennis was Rogers just descent. Yeah. I'd say growing up and having like U S open finals on the TV and my dad, like throwing it on my dad, wasn't the biggest tennis guy, but if Federer, you know, was playing the finals, whatever. And um, who was doing it back then? Was it Dick Eversall, whatever on the call? I, I forget, but it, there was just something about that, that gravitated and Federer come out like all black and just obliterate people. And I was like, hey, I mean, this guy's, <laughs> absolutely yes. cool student you start to follow it more and more in college i really got into it um especially in the gambling side of it that's where i really started to learn everyone's names uh honestly like just you know not being able to sleep in college and you know seeing what's you know maybe like the asian circuits going on and that stuff starting at like 11 p.m or whatever and going until you know the break of dawn so yeah that's stuff that's really how i got into like knowing everyone's names um uh, and then from there growing up further but fed and, and the u.s opens you know in that like you know early 2000s is when I really started to heat up into it. Yeah, you had that OG Dick Enberg, jo uh, Johnny Mac broadcast. That's call. what I was, Enberg, yeah, Enberg, yeah. And it was great because you'd see him lose in, in the French Open to Rafa and then win in Wimbledon. So as you got back-to-back -back finals there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we can kind of talk about a little stuff about how you got into Barstool and everything. But I, I always felt like given your company and where you guys have gone and how it's, you know, that you have to work kind of random hours, I kind of felt like tennis is, you know, it works with that in a lot of ways. Like you're, you're having to do a lot of things at random hours, but tennis is played literally all over the globe. So it kind of fits hand in hand. That's the beauty of it. You know, like I'm a, I'm a baseball guy at heart, obviously, but I do love my tennis. And the thing I really love about tennis is that it's on during the day, like during the week, like it, it, especially around this time, you know, with, with clay court and, and, and grass coming here, you know, um, hard court, you know, the American circuits typically like, you know, the big matches are at night, but um, I just love having stuff to like kind of distract me a little bit from work here and there. And, uh, you know, sometimes I just don't, you know, want to take a little breather from work. I'll, I'll watch some tennis. It's always kind of on the background. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, the Aussie open, I was just talking to my girlfriend about this because she's a night nurse. So she has an insane schedule and like kind of how we hit it off was, it was like the Aussie open. And she's like, why are you up right now? And <laughs> like, I'm just trying to watch you know, the big matches or whatever in January. And um, yeah, that, that's just, that is definitely part of it. That, that really appeases to me. Um, maybe as I get a little bit older, you know, I won't be able to stay up so much for the Aussie open. You know, I, I'm starting to kind of feel that with like, even like late night NBA basketball. I'm just like, man, this game's starting late, but I still have it in me to like try and watch as much as I can. And, and you know, especially during the work day. <laughs> Don't tell there, my boss that. <laughs> yeah, there, I won't. There was a few times that there were matches in Australia in the last couple of years. Uh, Federer, Millman, if you remember that match. Oh, yeah. Was, you know, right. And then Sitsipas coming back on Rafa. Those were two matches out on the West Coast where I'm like, I don't think anyone is awake and understanding what's exactly happening. It's like yeah. people are in there. So I'm one of them. I was there. I was there with you. Yeah. Like even like the Curios team match from a few yeah. years ago. They, like, I'm just up watching all that stuff. That Federer Millman, I think back to it. They were like, 
he should have lost that match 10 different times. <laughs> it's just like yeah. unbelievable. Eight, four, eight, four super tie break. He wins the last yeah. six. It was just, it was just, just nonsense. So when you got kind of immersed, you became the bar stool, like Yankees guy and in, in accordance with a lot of the sports covers in the New York teams, did you kind of look around and think like, maybe I'm the only tennis guy here? Is that a lane you just filled by accident? How did you become the de facto tennis guy? Yeah. I mean, at Barstool, there's a lot of freedom. Like there's, there's certain people, like there's a Patriots guy, you know, at the time when I came on, there was a Red Sox guy, you know, certain things you don't touch. And then you do see some openings and it was something I was passionate of. And you just kind of, kind of learn what to write about that really what attracts the listener. And in tennis, we do have our fair share of weird, random, viral stories. You know, I mean, we just saw it with Madrid, that whole disaster I was writing about yesterday. Um, so that kind of stuff does interest people. Um, and Benoit Pair, tanky matches. Like, that stuff is, like, <laughs> yeah. people find that funny. Um, you know, they're not going to want to hear, you know, the results of this upcoming ATP Rome or whatever. Um, you know, but, like, you try and find the stuff that is interesting. And, and, and in tennis, I do find that there is – consistently some really random weird stuff there's a lot of weird brains involved in tennis and some weird rules that get broken a lot and some controversies so that's the stuff i find to attack and yeah there's really no one else that even knows that's going on at barcelona so yeah if that field's open i took it um and uh, you know all, all the power you know i want to spread the game as much as i can uh and because i really there's so many so many fans i think if just like you know, if daniel if daniel medvedev was an american i think he would be unbelievably popular in this country he's not he's russian but if he like if that kind of personality and how good he is was american it, the, the sport would be huge you know hopefully taylor fritz is getting you know trying to become that kind of guy but i just feel like there are so many fun personalities in tennis that i wish americans could gravitate more to there's a lot of sports in, in america that people just love and it's tough to add another one in there so that's kind of the problem medvedev is just ridiculously funny like people don't understand it. They oh think my God. One of the actually funniest like athletes in the world. I think if you just listen to his interviews, they're so, so funny. Did you grow up going to the U S open, like having a slam and being able to, I mean, that's just so like, I'm jealous and envious of it. Anyone that lived that close to a grand slam, those opportunities, was that something that kind of got you, uh, your juices going? So believe it or not, no. Um, so growing up, uh, so like I said, I didn't really like get too, too much into it until college. Okay. And I went to college in Syracuse. So I'm back. I would be back up there around U.S. Open time. So I wouldn't be able to make trip. And then out of college, um, I stayed home for a little bit uh, before I moved into the city, like a couple of years after that. And I still didn't have the time. And then eventually, OK, I was like, OK, I want to go. But now I need people to go with. I don't really <laughs> want to go by myself. Yeah. And then just like. Two, three years ago, I can't remember the exact, we went and I, it ended up being, I don't know if this was the first day, this was the first tournament I went to, it was at the US Open, but it was Carlos coming back on Pass with the bathroom breaks and all that. That was like my first, I think that was like two years ago. That was my first real tournament I'd been to. And then from there, I was like, okay, I need to come here. And then I started to have some friendships with some players over the years. And I even saw Tommy down in Delray a couple of years ago. That was cool. Um, and yeah, now I go every single year. Now I'll probably go to the U.S. Open three or four times a tournament. And, you know, because it's just a subway ride at this point. Don't you feel like, and I almost put tennis in, in a sports category like hockey and some other ones where just going there could win people over. Because like, oh my God. once you're there, it doesn't maybe translate as well on television as it does being in the moment. Yeah, the ability to, especially the U.S. Open, the ability to just walk over from court to court and you know, the, it, there's, you know, the, the honey deuces and every, and the food is delicious. And it's, I, I actually did it last year. I brought two of my coworkers, um, Nate and, and fights. And we went to, of course, I've gotten some really good luck. You're going to find out here, but we yeah. went and saw sinner Carlos, like that went till <laughs> two 30 stayed all night. huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. At that point they were, once they saw the first set, they were like, okay, this isn't normal. Like th this guy's, these two are ridiculous here. And they kind of didn't know. Now they've gotten a little bit more into it. But um, it was just fun seeing those guys experience it for the first time. They're like, wow, this is – and then, obviously, when it gets really late at the U.S. Open, they let you go downstairs, you know, because they want to clean the top. And we were, like, for the fifth set, like, seventh row or whatever. It was unbelievable. And they at that point, they were, like, 
they were texting me like days after, like, I still can't believe we saw that. And then obviously he goes on to win the whole thing. Um, it was it's special. It's a really fun thing to go to in person. Like I'll say like NFL, I don't like going to in person. I'd rather watch it on TV. Um, you know, baseball, I, I do enjoy going to baseball games. NBA probably could watch on TV as well. Tennis man is just really, really fun in person. It is. I remember the first tournament I went to was Indian Wells, like I've been mean, probably seven, eight years ago. It was serving and it was Milos Raonic serving at 140. And I was just like, whoa, like what this is, you know, this you hear about this, you see it on TV when Isner serves, just saw him a couple months ago, but those serves at that level in person, you can't even begin. Yeah, I, I got to see Nick. Um, I can't remember who he played so early in the tournament. I want to say it was this past one. Um, he obliterated someone, and it's just seeing the Nick serves are just stupid. It's just absolutely dumb. I've yet to see Isner. Um, but Nick is, I mean, right up there with some of the best serves you can have. I would almost, I, you know, not anymore, but Karlovich would have been fun to see, I feel like, in person. Just, like, the angle of his serves are just so ridiculous. I will say the one bad thing about going to tennis, and they need to change this, and I think they've, they've talked about it, but the rule where you just can't, you got to wait outside for the two games to end, you know, yeah. every two games, that can get brutal because these games go long sometimes. You, know, you go to, like, three, a five. Yeah. The first three you, has to change. Like, that's yeah. everyone's on board with. Oh. You don't, yeah, you don't get the one game when they're already changing size. no it's brutal sometimes uh yeah especially if it's like a long deuce game or whatever got to change that but other than that i have a, i have a blast more with barstool hubs here on tennis channel inside in uh, i want us to kind of segue into the americans and you've mentioned kind of getting to know some of the players but where we are right now in the generation of talent it's been you know the 20 year dry spell of a major on the men's side and all the all that has been talked about but Hubs, do you think that the American game is thriving? Because you look at the numbers, there's a top 10 player, there's three in the top 20, eight in the top 40. Would you consider it thriving or do we need to get more, I guess, grand slam success at the end of the day? Got to get the one slam and then it really like a real impact is made. But man, over the last few years, something something has changed. And I'm almost thinking like there's going to be a documentary in like 10 years about someone behind the scenes who really just you know, started the, the, you know, the engine here to like get all these guys ramping up. And it, it's just, there's a wave. It's awesome. I and mean, you saw at the Aussie, like there's Tommy making a run and it's just cool. And Taylor, honestly, I didn't know if I, it to sustain, cause last year was a dream for him career year. I didn't know if 2023 was kind of going to continue that the way he's performed on clay is like, yeah, very surprising. Everyone talks about ceilings, obviously. Ben Shelton looked great. Cordes yeah. so much upside, but there is something to be said about the here and now that Fritz just gets results and yeah. impressive to me that U S open you were at last year. He yeah. lost to, you know, he lost to uh, Tracy Austin's son who was doing a great job and it was a great run by him, Yeah, but there's something with Fritz, how he's able to keep it going after a loss. He just turns the page and bounces back and, you know, he loses to center and Monte Carlo. He was upset. I feel like he handles losses so well and just has that you know has that dog in him he has some really good resiliency um and like ability to i feel like recover from injuries kind of quickly too um i feel like sometimes i thought he was gonna about way longer than he was and he manages to come back um yeah he, and his ability to just play now on every surface is, is something else um he needs to perform well at this u.s open he needs a deep u.s open run um and corda uh just getting back from the injury he has all the talent. I was there to see, I saw him and Tommy go at it. Um, I think it was on grandstand last year at the U S open. That was special. They had a little fun interaction at the net. Uh, yeah. That was, that was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think, I think Tiafo said it like, man, we just push each other. We're all kind of friends at this point. We're all kind of in it together. We all want U S tennis like back on the map here. And the moment we get that slam and whether if it's from Francis, whether if it's from Taylor, Sebastian, maybe even Tommy, like it's going to be a huge moment. Like those guys are going to go all the shows. They'll be house. They'll be close to household names. And we just need that. Cause you know, as much as winning Indian Wells for Taylor did, mm -hmm. I don't know how much it actually did for tennis in America. Like you need to win a slam. I think that would be, that would be ginormous. I agree. I, I would just add that beating Rafa, I know he was a little compromised, but getting that win over a big guy does legitimize things. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it definitely does. It definitely yeah. does. Um, you know, and Taylor was going through his own things too. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just Rafa. So that kind of almost leveled it out a little bit. Yeah. And it's so like, you see it. I think that's one of the more interesting aspects of tennis is when you see an opponent like a Rafa or a Novak 
fed struggling and you don't like you almost let up a little bit you you don't yeah. you lose that because you if you want to beat those guys you have to one hope it's not their best day and you have to be on your best day yeah. and for those guys when you see them struggling a little bit you you let up and then all of a sudden you know maybe their cramp lessons or whatever or they yeah. roll it out during a, you know a changeover and then boom you, you just lost the match. Yeah. It's so hard to still yeah. do what Taylor did in Indian Wells. And I don't think people appreciate that enough. We saw that with Alcaraz this year, right? In some of the matches that he yeah. was hampered in, he still got, you know, the ability to come up with ridiculous plays. Oh, yeah. And just on that American tennis thing, that first, I guess, wave of players, there is something to be said about the 96, 97 generation. Cause you talk Tiafo, Fritz, Paul, Opelka was in there. That's four world beaters. And you know as well as I do that that doesn't happen every birth year, every class. Like they've got four legit guys and somebody like Tiafo, who you saw at the U.S. Open. I mean, man, yeah. if he gets going, that's like generate. That is the wide reach that most tennis players unfortunately don't have. Hundred percent. I mean, he gets like Bradley Beal to come up from D.C. to go see him, whatever. And Jimmy Butler is a huge fan. Right. I don't know. People don't talk about that enough for how big of a tennis fan. I would love. <laughs> to just have a 20 to 30 minute conversation about tennis with him, with, with Jimmy Butler. But, uh, you know, he went to Argentina to watch. Yeah. Like it's, it's, if he has a little bit of time off, he goes to see tennis. Right. I, I absolutely love that. Uh, I don't love that he's beating my Knicks right now, but uh, yeah, the tennis <laughs> yeah. part is cool. But yeah, I, I 100% agree. Tiafo winning would be special because he has just a, th those guys are all likable. His personality, Tiafo's, is just a, to another level. I feel like that. You, you pair a slam with him and you're talking about just an absolute superstar in this country. What was it like? Cause I know he visited the headquarters, but getting to know Tommy Paul, he's by all accounts, just a very likable, uh, good guy and somebody that's been open. I mean, his coach Brad Stein told me literally a month ago that, look, we had to get him to lock back into tennis, but once he made that commitment, it's like a different player, different person, but what's it like to get to know him and kind of, you know, the behind the curtain of Tommy Paul. Yeah, his um his manager at the time, uh, Jermaine reached out to me, uh, and I had just written about him. He just came off. He was it Kachin Hatchinov he beat or or is it Dimitrov? He had a very good win in Australia that uh the previous D Dimitrov slam. Yeah. Dimitrov, yeah. He said that was that was really fun and, and that was a late one too. But I remember writing it. And I think he saw me mention Tommy in a blog. And he's like, man, we'd love to have him come. And I was like, well, one, we don't have a tennis podcast. I have a Yankee podcast that that doesn't that doesn't gel there. Yeah. And like, no offense at the time, he's not big enough to go on like part of my take. And I think he would admit that too. You know, he was outside the top fifty or like fringe top fifty then. Um, but I was like, hey man, we got a ping pong table that we 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 started this like we barstool streams. Uh, we just had like a stream room where we just play like darts and ping pong and cornhole, or whatever. I'm like, Hey, we got a ping pong table. We just wants to like, you know, mess around for a little bit. He came in, we met him and a few of his boys came with, um, and we, we played for like two plus hours for whatever reason. I always talk about this with, my, with Frankie, my coworker, like that video never made the light of day. And I don't know where it went, but he just played us for two hours. And I think I got like six or seven points on him. He was only beaten once. Okay. And, but man, like you don't like you, you question like, okay, does the ping pong translate, you know, with tennis and all that it does with Tommy, he was ridiculous, but also like just the coolest, nicest dude. Um, and he, he wasn't like in his groove then. And from that point for like a little, a year or two, you didn't know what was going on with him. And maybe as you were talking about with his coach, like, you know, with the focus problems, but then all of a sudden something clicked last year, or yeah. maybe it was just winning that title. Um, the Sweden one, right? The I Sweden think that was the one at the yeah. end of that year. Yeah. 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 I remember watching that. I was I, where was I? Was I in San? I was I was somewhere not in this uh not in this state. I maybe maybe I was Florida and I was watching it. Yeah. And I was just so pumped for him. It was so, you know, not the biggest term in the world, but man, just a little bit of success for a tennis player with like, you know, how much uh mental game tennis is can do wonders for him. I feel like from that point, he just jumped and uh and also, I will say, I think the dating game with him, who he's dating at certain points, I think does wonders yeah. for him. And I think right now with Paige, he's in a very good spot. So yeah. I just like, you know, it's the mental game. You just got to be happy off the court and relaxed. And uh, it's fun. He's one of the best athletes, I feel like, on the tour. And uh, when he's got it all going, he's an extremely fun person to watch. Yeah, Riley Opelka told me he was Ferris Bueller growing up. So I could kind of see a little bit of that coming forward. But no, I mean, he's... <laughs> It was when, for me, it was when he beat Alcaraz in Canada last summer. That was cool. I mean, that was, well, like you, you put that up. That was a three hour match and just the ability to stay in there. The Aussie semi, 
no shame, obviously, in losing the Novak Djokovic in a tournament that he's owned for so long. But yeah. he's somebody that I, I've got my eye on. And, you know, you look forward to what, I guess, to kind of segue Tiafo said about we want to get the game to be a little more lax on some of these strict codes. You, you reference it with the sitting down for a couple games and not going in. Yeah. I think that there could be a way, and, and I'll toss it to you on this one, but we have all these 250 tournaments, people knowing the show, listening to this show, know what that means. But the smaller event should be something where you can try some things. Doesn't mean it's going to stick, but why not just experiment with, you know, some noise and, you know, opening things up a little bit? I don't hate it. I think noise is like, I don't know. I like when a crowd is energized and, you know, some people, you know, you'll, you'll read some Reddit comments afterwards and they'll be like, Oh, the crowd was so bad or whatever. It's like, ah, yeah, kind of a little disrespect, but like, I don't know, fun atmospheres are fun atmospheres, man. And that, that like, when you hear crowd wars, like really get into it, you know, maybe a little boozed up or whatever, have some fun with it. Like, I don't know. Don't just try not to be too like, you know, stuck up what I just, just enjoy it a little bit. I, you know, and I like when guys play to the crowd and, and feed with it and maybe they're against the crowd or whatever, you know, Medvedev, you know, he likes to do that. And Novak thrives. It's basically his, his fuel is, is, is an angry crowd, a hostile crowd. But yeah, I, I almost, you know, the, I get the, the tradition of being polite and all that, mm-hmm. but I do also like the side where it gets hostile and rowdy. It is yeah, fun not, fun. A, not every tournament has to be waste management. A right. There, but hey, it doesn't mean you're going to play poorly. You reference Medvedev and Djokovic doing well. How about Ben Shelton in Australia playing in Aussie? He was going back to his college days. This is just a road game. And he went out there and beat him in front of, the, in front of his home faithful. I had no doubt in my mind he was going to win that match. No, no doubt in my mind. Like he, he's just so – he, he – his Florida clips are so much fun to just go back and watch and just, just get so into it. And he picks his spots of when to really scream. And it's like, and it's yeah. just, it's just an incredibly, yeah, we talk about, I, I think he's probably a year or two away from like, like top 10 ish or whatever, consistently in that level. And then he'll probably won't leave it for a very long time, but man, that guy has all the tools and he's exciting. And you know, his, he smiles all the time. He's having fun out there. Ben Shelton is going to be a super, he's, he's, Pro, it, the question is not um, – it's not if an American player breaks through. It's whether someone does it before Ben Shelton does. That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah. Can can one can Fritz, Tommy, Tiafo, uh, Sebi, can one of those guys win a slam before Shelton does? Because Shelton's going to win one. I would, I would agree with that. I think Sebi would be a guy that I would put upside in. Now, the wrist is always a, a sensitive thing. But, yeah, Shelton is also – if you want to compare other sports, he's the project I would like to take on because he's so good, but still so raw that yeah. the right coach, this could be a very profitable opportunity. Yeah. He's got to kind of learn like the rhythm of the game a little bit, if that makes any sense, but has all the tools to do quite literally anything he wants. And like to have, you know, his kind of speed, the his ability to hit any single shot with that serve. Just, just a nightmare for almost anybody who's met you still right now. It's like, he's probably not going to, I would be shocked if he wins a slam in the next year or whatever, but there's no top seed that wants to face him in like the second or third round of a slam. That is just not a fun opportunity. And I guess it leads to the bigger question right now. Alcaraz is the guy. I mean, there's still obviously Djokovic, but for this generation, we know Alcaraz is the guy, not perfect, but close to it based on how he (laughs) plays. What will it take for an American or another player his era to step up and beat him in a big tournament because it's as tall a task as there is right now. Well, first of all, I need a tournament where Djokovic and Carlos are in the, are, now I guess it's going to happen with Rome, right? They're it's still, happened, hasn't happened since Madrid last year. That isn't is that insane. Absurd. I actually wrote a blog. I don't, I think I was just talking about Carlos like a week ago and in it, I had said like, here we go, Madrid, finally Carlos. And then like four hours later, Novak drops out and I had to post like an update on it. But I think Rome right now, mm-hmm. we're, we're locked in. So, okay, everyone just bubble wrap each other. You know, no one get, you know, get yeah. sick, get hurt or whatever. They, they need to face each other. Because that's really what it comes, like that will be, that's the real test here. Because when Carlos wins a tournament, it's like, well, you put an asterisk over that, Novak's not in it. And then, you know, if, if Carlos had his injury, didn't play the Aussie a little bit after that, you know, Novak did his, so I want to see him play each other, but man, what it takes to beat him. And honestly, I get the feel like you, you have a chance to do it at best of three sets here. Although no one's really even like up until the final in Madrid, no one even took a set off the kid mm-hmm. and he's just getting better and better and, and more experienced and stronger health is really the only thing that's going to stop him. But once you get to slams where it's best of five sets, it turns into one of those things where 
it is so hard. Even if you're up 2-0, like the, the classic Novak, right? Like he'll just be able to reset, do his thing, and just destroy you. Once he gains like that little sliver of momentum, there's nothing you can do. I, I just always credit – I hate Novak because obviously team fed, um, but I respect so much his mental game. And yeah. Carlos has a bit of that. Carlos has that ability to just flip the switch, and once it's switched, you have no chance of beating him. I mean, the last – that U.S. Open run was, what, three straight five-setters and then a yeah. four-setter? Like, on the, <laughs> finishing – There's no reason he should have beaten Sinner. None. Like, if you – there were so many moments where he was just done. Like, oh – Damn, he he broke back here, but there he lost. There's no way he can do it here. There were like four no way moments yeah. in that match alone, and it just didn't matter. Sinner is a guy that I think does have the weapons to be in the fight with him. Aside from that, and I know most you know casual fans might not know the John Leonard Struff story, the finalist last week in Madrid, but maybe that's and maybe why it's a guy like Shelton or or somebody like that. I think you have to have a big serve and you have to shorten points because you're not going to win an endurance test with him. It just won't happen. He moves too well. It's it's insane. Um, you're probably right. Um, you at least have to like this the big serve like that has to push him off the court a little bit and not because once he gains court control and then he's able to push you with his forehand and then throw you with that drop shot, which I compare to the Steph Curry three of just being one of the more unstoppable moves in sports. Yeah. But once he's pushing you with his forehand and you're you're just too off the court, you have no chance. So maybe it is the formula is a big serve. And yeah. just get him off balance that way. Otherwise, you have no chance. Like Rafa. I mean, that was the book on him. It's yeah. like going to take weapons. Yep. Uh, a few more things with Barstool Zero yep. here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Well, I don't want to let you go without bringing up the topic of, you know, I wouldn't even say villains, but the counterculture guys in tennis. And there's Nick Kyrgios, who a lot's been said, good and bad about him. Olga Rune stepping into that role as well. And I, I'm not on the side of we need people to just be jerks out there, but it is nice to have some people that are going against the grain and I'll call them Mavericks, let's say. I, listen, like Nick, blog, when Nick does something, I blog it. Like that guy is so polarizing and I, you know, some people think he's horrible for the sport. I think the sport needs it. Need, well, maybe not needs him anymore because he may have bridged the gap to Carlos and like, you know, the guy who's really taking, taking the reins here. But for a little while, we really needed Nick to do his thing and to win a few tournaments and make a few runs and anything he does at the Aussie is electric. It's a shame he wasn't there this mm -hmm. past one, but um, I absolutely love watching him play. Um, and he is just willing to speak his mind on quite literally anything. Um, and he loves his Celtics. So I appreciate that. Uh, they like the, the love of the NBA and Holger is getting there too. And, and of course, who is there to defend Holger, but Nick, yeah. Um, uh, right there with him. Cause he kind of, he only feels, I mean, he knows what, what he's going through. Um, from what I understand, I think that's really just a Stan versus Holger thing. I, I really don't think Holger is, I, I, I think he means well, I think he oh, gets a little, yeah. I think, he, I think he feeds yeah. off the crowd a ton and it may be good. And he's still young. What's he 20. And, uh, and yeah, he's just he's so talented. What's he number seven. Now he'll be definitely one of the names making big noise at the French, um, I, I think, I don't, I don't find anything wrong with those guys. I think they're great for the sport. Yeah. Maybe not like you, you shouldn't have to like, I wouldn't, I don't want people forcing themselves to become a villain, but when it naturally flows that way and it's a guy who plays with the crowd and maybe the crowd isn't going with them and he plays with that and it makes them angrier and better. That's cool. That's all fun. That's exciting. That's, that's the stuff that tennis, that tennis casuals and people who don't even like tennis, when they see those clips on Twitter, that's okay. When's that guy playing next? I want to see those matches. I don't want to see boring stuff. I want to see Nick Kyrgios, you know, going between his legs and, and, you know, pumping up the crowd and, you know, just, it's just awesome watching those guys. So um, it is funny that, that Nick is, is to Holger's side here, but uh, it does seem like, well, at least maybe I'm just going off Nick's quotes, but like, he is well liked in in the locker room. There are a lot of people who like Holger Rune, and maybe Stan is just one of those guys aging out of the sport a little bit and doesn't tolerate it because you know he's used to the, the Federer days. You know. Yeah, I think I think the Stan stuff they were water under the bridge with that. I think they were able to kind of let bygones be bygones, which is fine. Like it's competitive. You're not yeah. trapped out there. You you handle it in the locker room. And curious, I've been on record as long as he's giving effort. That was the one issue I had the taking matches, which it seems he's grown up with. Yeah, but oh, it's great. Say whatever, play differently. It's it's a fun, exciting thing. And we know that when Kyrgios plays like that Wimbledon match against Tsitsipas, where he just dragged him completely down into the mud and Tsitsipas didn't know how to handle it. And I love that. It's a different strategy tactic that we see in sports all the time. I 
I was so excited going into that match and that match delivered everything and more like so it's very few like sports yeah. sports like matchups can be great on paper and like you know the, the the trash talk and then once it happens and that literally was exactly what we needed and wanted it was so cool for him to make yeah oh my god I, I loved I loved every part of that match and he had to he I mean to for Nick to be on the side of in control in like in terms of his emotions and to get Sitsi Pass to like you know spike the ball or whatever and then oh my god the the theatrics of Nick complaining to the umpire like he should get a point penalty like the roles reversed there it was all too good those matches were perfect it was so good uh well before we wrap this up this has been a blast uh looking at Rome our last big tournament expanded draw which is a new thing going forward this year you like any picks like any plays for Rome or Roland Garros where it's Alcaraz Djokovic and then Obviously, we don't know with Rafa. Any uh, any picks you like there? Yeah. So so Rafa is not in Rome, right? Where is he? Not in Rome. Yeah, not in Rome. Right. So, man, it's every every year I do this where I have a conversation with my buddies, you know, who we bet on tennis, and we're like, and, and we'll we'll see like a you know an interesting line with Rafa where he's not as big a favorite, and we'll convince ourselves like, okay, they're trying to bait people to take Rafa here. Let's be the guys that knocks out Rafa French. It never works. It just doesn't. And we're here again. He hasn't played in months. He's not the favorite. He's not even the second favorite, right? I believe he's the third behind Djokovic. What are we going to see here? Because you know, I, I feel like the plan here is he wins this and he rides off into the sunset because there's no better way. To- though. I mean, he he's never not played wrong. Like that's, he's never right. played anything. So I know what you're saying. This is, we're all idiots because we always, he was third favorite last year, by the way. And he's and he won. <laughs> so. Yeah. So like we we put we he's putting clearly all of his eggs in this basket, right? He didn't want to um, mess with any potential injury coming into this, you know, a, a, in, in a random tournament that just prevented him from playing the French because that's obviously all he cares about. So um, it's it's going to be an interesting conversation with my brain over the next week week or so. Hey. Do we think Rafa can do this again? Do we want to be in the same situation as we are where he's facing Casper Ruud and Casper can't do a single thing because it's Rafa on clay? Like, and you go down the list. And you, you, I mean, it's just impossible to know how healthy he is. It's just, no one has any clue. Um, and, you know, if he faces a Carlos, I don't think he'd have a chance. Like, I, but, but that's me saying that. And then three weeks from now, he beats Carlos. And I'm like, I did it again. Rafa did it again because he's Rafa Nadal on clay at, at Roland Garros. Um, and then there's the question with Novak, man, like, what is his situation? I mean, we'll, we'll get a good test here, like right, in Rome, but his elbow looked all out of sorts and he's had elbow issues in the past. You know, um, so my pick is Carlos because he's an absolute machine. And if you pick against him, you're just not going to have a good time. Maybe you, maybe you end up being right by picking against Carlos, but you, it's not fun. You'd rather root for Carlos and he's doing his stuff. Even when he seems down and out and he switches the momentum, there's nothing like it right now in tennis. So he's just an easy guy to root for. I want him to win French and start racking up those slams and, and, and you know, go up that list because we're stuck at one. Uh, but well, let's get higher. He is very fun and he is money when he's down a break as well. Like, no, oh my God. you'd rather have coming back into a match, into a set than yeah. Carl Salcres. And I, and I got to say, I think you're in the same boat, like growing up as a Federer guy. It's a little sad though to see so Federer's gone and now Rafa it's coming like this this era is changing and then before you know it or it's already happened then you're just older than all the tennis players I know that is that is sad yeah like I'm older than Tommy like that's yeah. just depressing <laughs> yeah. um I will say yes it's sad a hundred percent um like you see him hosting the Met Gala and he's just in post retirement mode I'm like god damn it he still looks like he could play like why don't you just give it one more go that's not happening but um it is nice because Rafa is fading out here, whether this is his last one or whatever, to, you know, how many more he tournaments he plays at this point. But it's nice that there is a true heir to the throne here because, you know, you thought for a little bit with Fed bowing out and then Med kind of like lost his mental game a little bit once he collapsed to Rafa. Like, is Novak just going to blow through these guys and end up with 35 grand slams? Yeah. The answer is no, because here's Carlos Alcaraz, who, and granted, they've only played once. But man, he's not going anywhere. He's only getting stronger, better, smarter, faster, whatever it is. He's just, it's all increasing by the, by the second. Djokovic is going to have to scratch, you know, you know, for every inch he can to win another slam at this point if Carlos is healthy in there. And that's really fun. And that's all I can really ask for. Yeah, it's look, it's shaping up to be because just because we haven't seen Djokovic and Alcaraz in the same tournament, shaping up to be a tremendous Rome, an amazing French Open. 
could see Rafa bowing out as well. There's just so many possibilities here. We know there's going to be chaos. Uh, Hubs, this, this has been a blast. Uh, pleasure chatting with you. Always a fan of your work. Last thing, the New York sports scene. I know the Knicks are down. I know the Yankees are kind of there. It's it's a little better than it was maybe a couple of years ago. There is that. Yeah, the Knicks were, you know, they may, they won a playoff series and all that. I don't know what their ceiling per se is. The Yankees are a mess with injuries. Uh, I'm just, hey, U.S. Open, let's get let's get here quickly this year. Because uh, yeah. I don't know what these next few months are. Hey, Judge is back tonight, so that's a little positive stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the U.S. Open at this point more than the Yankees. All right, that was Barstool Hubs. Follow him on Twitter at Barstool Hubs. He's putting out great picks and, uh, you know, leading the fight for tennis in America in the pop culture uh, Norman Kleutcher. But uh, Eric Hubs, always a pleasure, man. Appreciate you. We'll have to do this again. Thanks, thanks Mitch. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having me on. It was a blast.